Hey everybody, this is Alex Merced and welcome to this first video uh, episode of Alex Merced Coder. So basically now YouTube supports sort of like podcasts on the YouTube platform. Um, not podcast the way as I understand them since I can't distribute the RSS feed, but um, yeah, I can do sort of like a, a sequential program here on YouTube. So what I'm going to do that, I'm going to kind of start back from square run. Um, if you're not familiar with my YouTube channel already, um, you know, I have thousands and thousands of videos on software development. Um, but what I'm going to do is I'm, in this series, we're going to start back from square one and, um, uh, yeah, teach you how to develop websites. So there's a couple things that you're going to need, um, for this. So this first video is going to be about getting set up for the series. Okay. So essentially you need a few things. You need Google Chrome. Okay. So that is the browser that I'm using and it does matter that you use what I'm using because different browsers are going to have different visuals as far as like developer tools and things like that and, and render things slightly differently. So if you want to follow things and for things to look exactly the way that I have them, um, you're going to want Google Chrome. Okay. So install Google Chrome or uh, probably any Chromium based browser should work, but Google Chrome would be ideal. Okay. You also are going to want Visual Studio Code. So code.visualstudio.com. You just go over here, download Visual Studio Code. That's this editor here. Uh, we'll talk more about that in a second. And I think to get started, that's all you will need. Okay, so basically what we'll do is we'll get focused on front-end development for the first so many videos. Um, and we'll kind of go from there. Okay, so with that, I'm going to assume that you have Visual Studio Code, you have Chrome. And, you know, just to give you a quick tour of Visual Studio Code, when you open up Visual Studio Code, you're going to see a window like this. What you can do, what I rec always recommend doing is that, you know, you have different ways you can open up VS Code. I would always open up to a particular folder. So have like a folder for the particular project you're working on. Just make an empty folder on your computer and then use the file explorer, open folder, and just find the folder that you're looking for. I'm using Linux as my operating system. So if this doesn't look like your computer because you're using Windows or Mac, that's fine. You would just kind of interpret it as it would be for your particular operating system. So, but it should, you should still see file open folder. If it's a Mac, it's going to be like all the way up here because Mac has the, the menu options in the, in this bar. Okay. I have auto save on just to keep that in mind. So you won't see me save, but the idea is that you do need to make sure you save your changes. So you can either turn on auto save. Um, I do that so that way you don't have to watch me save all the time. Um, or just make sure you save. Again, generally, if you ha if you don't have auto save on and you make a change to a file, you see like a white dot, just so you're aware. So, oftentimes people will be like, "Why my thing is not working?" It's because they forgot to save it. Okay, so those are the main like options there that for you to be aware of. Now, here, this is referring to this. This shows you all your files. So basically, the way this reads is that you see here. There's the name of the folder that I have open. So that's actually the name of the folder that I have open. I can open it up and I can see all the files that I have in there, which are currently nothing. Now, if I wanted to look through all the files in my current folder or the current area that I'm working out of, I can use this search tool and I can search for like a particular piece of text and it'll tell me every time it sees that in the files that are open. Later on, we're gonna talk about working with Git. You can work with Git using this tool right here. So um, we'll cross that bridge another time. This is for debugging. Uh, probably won't use that much. I generally debug a slightly different way. We'll get to that. Okay. Um, this is probably not on your VS Code because this is something from a extension that I have. So you probably won't see this remote explorer tool. And then you'll see like this Tetris block here. This is for installing extensions. Extensions extend how your VS Code works and adds all sorts of features. Okay. Ones that you should install are things like, let's see here, we just type in like HTML. Uh, actually, let's just take a look through the ones I have installed and I'll tell you which ones you should be installing. So if I click here and I click install, this is what I have installed. I have a lot of them because I work in a lot of different languages. Auto close tag will be useful. Auto rename tag is useful. Okay, and the way you install them is you just search for them up here and then they'll pop. It'll pop up. Uh, better comments is pretty good. CSS peak is pretty useful. Color tabs is pretty useful. Okay. Um, do, 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 do. 
So Intellico, Jinja, JSON. Uh, let's see here. Shaker. Live server, you're definitely going to want live server. That's going to come up, so you want to make sure that you install that for you to be able to do the exercises we're doing in this early part of the course. Essentially what live server is, because this is a very particular extension, what it does, it actually creates a server in the folder that you're working out of. So it's going to create a web server on your computer so you can test out your website. So um, you definitely want that installed. Let's see here. Uh, do, 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 do. Peacock. This is the, this is not that important, but this is the reason why like every time I open up a window, it's a different color on the sides. So that's what's doing that because yours probably doesn't have a different color. Uh, prettier. Maybe we'll talk about that at a different time. But that's the thing that kind of automatically uh, prettys up my code. So you'll see like sometimes when I save, it'll automatically like add tabs and clean up a little bit of my syntax. Uh, Rainbow brackets is pretty good, although I think this is now built into VS Code, so you don't necessarily need to install this anymore. Like VS Code should just have that functionality of coloring parentheses, square brackets, things like that uh, automatically. Um, I have a lot of extensions. But we're almost at the end. Okay, so those would be the ones I'd recommend. The ones, and again, you can rewind if you need to hear that tool list again to know which ones to install. Okay, and again, a lot of these are more things that came with different extensions that I have installed, so don't worry about those. Okay, cool. So now let's like work on building like our first website. Okay, so generally the way a web server works, so like for example, you generally always want to start with a file called index.html. There's a special treatment of a file called index.html. Okay, and it's called a HTML file because you're using a language called hypertext markup language uh, to ex to basically express the structure of your page, the structure of your content. Okay, um, so for example, maybe I want to express that there's a heading on the page. I can use a tag, which is these are referred to as HTML tags. So you see the syntax. This is the, the what's called the opening tag. And then this is what's called the closing tag. So the idea is what's inside of the H1 is whatever's between the opening and closing tag. So the heading is going to be between the opening and closing tag. So we're going to say, you know, hello world. Okay. So now I've just expressed that I have a heading on my page and there's up to six headings. So each one's progressively smaller. H1, H2, H3, H4, H5, H6. Um, and now if you have the live server extension installed, I can actually test this out. I, if I right-click on index.html, I'll see this little option open with live server because I have that live server extension installed. And it's going to open up a browser and we can see that, that, hey, look, there's my heading. Okay. Very cool. Okay. Now notice if I do this, like if I take off this, see how I, it says index.html explicitly there. If I take that off and just go to this address here, so this is the address of the local web server. So just so you know for future reference, 127.0.01 always refers to your computer. Another name for that IP address, so whenever you see 127.0.01, you can either say that or you can say localhost. Localhost means the computer that you're on. Okay? And basically what happens when you run a server on a computer, you can choose one of up to 65,000 ports. So live server just runs it on port 5500 on your computer. That's all you need to know. So basically I'm saying, hey, I want to access whatever is available on my computer on port 5500. That's what that's saying. Okay. Um, but notice I'm taking off the slash index.html that was there before. And see, it works. It takes me back to that same index.html. That is the special behavior of index.html. That whenever you access a, a website, it's always going to look for that index.html by default. Okay. So for example, if I were to create another file, let's call it like cheese.html, and then we'll put in an, another heading. Or actually what we'll do is we'll use a p tag. p tag stands for paragraph. So the idea is like it's a block of text. So a p tag, we'll also do hello world again. Okay. In order for me to see that cheese.html, I have to type in 
cheese.html. So for any file other than index.html, I have to put the name. Okay, and you can tell that I'm looking at the different page because, see, this time we don't see hello world as a heading. We see it as plain text because it's inside of a paragraph tag, not a heading tag. Okay, cool. Okay, and just to kind of take that one step further, if I were to make a folder here called cheese, so let's make a folder. So if I click this little button here, that makes a folder. Cheese. If I were to make, if I were to make a copy of both of these files in there, but just so you can tell the difference, we're going to say goodbye world in both of them. So this will say goodbye. And then this one will say goodbye world. Okay, when I type in slash cheese, not slash cheese.html, but slash cheese, see it says goodbye world. And notice it says it as a heading. Because again, when I say the folder, so again, basically the main area of the folder, because a server is running out of this folder, represents the 127.0.01 colon 5500. Now it's like, and then basically everything's relative from there. So slash cheese means the folder that's in there. And then when I, when I just refer to the folder, it's going to look by default for an index.html. So see, that's why this index.html that has a heading that says goodbye world is what shows up. And again, for me to see that cheese.html that's in there, I'd actually have to explicitly type it out. Okay, so just keep in mind like that's how web servers behave. Okay, basically all files have to be explicitly named unless they're called index.html. So basically index.html is always the default file in that folder. Okay, I don't have to write index.html. I can just say, hey, what's inside the cheese folder? And it's going to open up the index.html in the cheese folder. And if I say, hey, just what's this is referred to as like the host, if I just put the host, it's going to just show me what's the index.html on the root folder, the, the folder at the top is level. Okay, hello world. Okay, just to kind of understand like how that server behaves. This is how all web servers, not all web servers behave, but all static web servers behave. Okay, so now that we've established that, let's talk a little bit more about HTML. Okay, so let's go back to our main index.html here. Okay, typically you don't just want to put like an h1 tag like this. Now what's going to happen is that there's a bunch of boilerplate that's required. Now browsers are pretty smart nowadays. So if I right click on the screen and I click this little inspect button, it's going to pop out a thing called web developer tools or development tools or dev tools. Okay. And this is essentially going to be a lot of tools for us to kind of see um, what's on the page. So if I look at it, this element section shows me what the browser is actually rendering. So even though I only put an H1 in the file, notice it created a head tag for me, it created this HTML tag for me, created this body tag for me. None of this is which is in my file. Okay. So the browser will fill in those gaps for you, but you're much better off putting that code yourself. So let's talk about that. So generally that what's required in an HTML file is an HTML tag. This just designates that this is where the HTML is. Okay, and in that you're going to have two tags, a head tag. A head tag is generally where you're going to put information about the site that's not visible on the site. Okay, and then the body tag is where you put all the visible stuff. Okay, so basically all the visual stuff in your website is going to be in the body tag. Okay, so things that would, like, what's a non-visible thing that would go in the head tag? You might have a title tag. Okay, a title is what shows up here okay so basically in the tab of the page so we're going to say hey my if i say my page inside title okay you're going to see that when i refresh this see that changes to my page okay wonderful well on the body here's where i would put all the visual stuff so i might put a heading so say hey h1 my heading then i want to maybe put some text so, so a p tag for a block of a paragraph and say hello and, you know, well, I'll just put in some dummy text. Okay, we have some dummy text. Okay, and you see, like, there it is. Like, you see a website starting to kind of develop. Okay, and then each each of these are called block elements. Okay, a block element is any HTML element that takes up a whole row. So, for example, if I go back here and I use this little tool here. Okay, well, actually, I don't even need to do that. I could just go here and I can highlight different things so you can see them visually. But if I click on them, if I click on the h, if I click on the h1 here, 
you can see like if you take a look at the, what's highlighting on the screen, it's highlighting the whole row. So even though my heading is just a few letters off to the left, the actual H1 is taking up the full width. Okay, a block always takes up the full width. The height is always equal to the content that is in the block. And you'll see the P tag is also a block. See, it takes up the full width. So they stack on top of each other. Okay? So lots of things are block elements, and they have that block behavior where they stack on top of each other. Other things are going to be inline elements. So watch what happens when I try to add, like, if I do, like, a span tag. Okay? A span tag, which really doesn't do much of anything. Okay? You'll see why we would use it in a second. Okay, but a span tag is an inline element. So if I write here, like, cheese... Okay, now watch what happens when we go to the website. Notice it's still in the same line. It's all, so basically, a, anything inside of a span tag, a span doesn't create a new block. So it won't, you know, just go right below it. But if I were to do that with a p tag, or actually another example of a block is a div, which stands for division. So literally anytime you just need a block, a div kind of does the job. If I say cheese here, and that's with three exclamation points. So you notice that one goes down to another block because a div is a block ele a level element. It takes up the full width. So anything inside that div is going to take up that full width. Okay? While the span did not. Okay? So generally you want to think about like, hey, how, what's the structure of my website? What should be in a block? You know, what are the different blocks in my website? And you kind of think about it that way. You think of your website as like a bunch of squares and stuff that's inside those squares. So whenever you designate something, you think about it, is it a square? Or is it something inside of a square? Okay. So, for example, my text is something inside this square that is the p tag. Okay. Cool. But as you see here, like this looks kind of ugly. We're not used to websites being so ugly. Okay. The way you style them is you use something called CSS. It's another language. So we now see that there's HTML that allows us to express what content is on the page. But we want to talk about how that content looks like. That's where CSS comes in. Okay, and for now, we'll just use a style tag to express what's called our CSS rules. Okay, we'll get more complicated as more episodes come out. But at its simplest, I can sit there and say, hey, what I want to style by, based on its tag. So I can say, hey, the H1. And then the rules of how I want it to appear are going to be in these curly brackets. Okay, so, you know, I may want to change the background color background color of it and we'll say hey the background color is going to be black okay the problem is if I do that see now that block is black I can't read the text anymore so then what I may want to do is change the, the font color which is a property called color I will say white okay and see there we go I've made some cosmetic changes and you can make pretty much any cosmetic change you can think of like the world of CSS is huge okay you can spend years upon years learning all of CSS and really kind of mastering HTML, CSS, and then eventually we're going to show you JavaScript. Okay, so HTML does the job of allowing you to describe the structure of content on your page. CSS allows you to describe how that content looks like, and then you're going to have JavaScript that allows you to describe how to interact with that content. Okay, so if I make a script tag. That allows me to write JavaScript. Eventually, you're going to move our CSS into their own file and our JavaScript into their own file because it's just a lot neater that way. But you can see here, I can write CSS and JavaScript all in the same file if I wanted to. Generally, you don't do that because it gets cluttered and sometimes you need it across multiple pages. So then you're copying and pasting a lot. So usually, you separate them out. But you know what I can do here is I can do something like, hey, I want to make let's say I want to make this div that says cheese with three exclamation points clickable I can go grab so these are called comments so they allow me to kind of write comments in my JavaScript I can go grab the div so I'll say document dot query selector and say hey grab me the div and I'm gonna save it in a variable a variable is just gonna be a way for me to contain a piece of information so I'm just going to declare a variable. And so I'm saying, hey, I'm going to create a variable called div. And inside this variable called div, using this function, I am getting that div from my HTML. Okay. 
And then I'm going to say, hey, when you click the div, do something. And the way we do that is we say there's going to be an event. When you click on the div, that's going to trigger an event. So we're going to say div dot add event listener. So this is saying, hey, we're going to, we want to listen for an event on this div element that we have in this variable. So we're going to say, hey, whenever there's a click on the div, we're going to want this function to run. Okay. So this function here is going to run anytime I click. So this is a function is just going to be a bundle of code. Again, we're going to spend more time with JavaScript specifically later on, but this is just to show you what you can do. And we're going to say, hey, when you click the button, we'll do an alert that says, hey, you click the button. Okay, that's going to make a little pop-up. So let's try that out. So if I click on this, it doesn't do anything. But if I click on the cheese with three exclamation points, see, I get this little pop-up. Hey, you click the button. So again, the HTML allows me to put the structure of the content initially on my page. The CSS allows me to express how that content should look like. And the JavaScript allows me to make that content interactive. Okay. And generally, these are the three building blocks of modern user interfaces. Because even most, not just websites, but most applications you use now use HTML, CSS, and JavaScript in order to describe the interfaces that you interact with when you interact with many applications. Okay, for example, Visual Studio Code, this is all built in HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Okay, so there is a very powerful set of skills to get good with, okay, because they have so many different applications, whether it's building mobile applications, building desktop applications, building web applications, um, you know, they, it goes a long way in knowing your HTML, your CSS, and your JavaScript, and really spending the time to get adequate to skilled with those with those particular skills. Okay, it takes years to really master them. You're not going to just watch a few videos and become a master HTML, CSS, JavaScript person. But hopefully, by watching these videos, you will get good enough that you can experiment and play and continue to learn more, because it's really going to be in the experimenting, trying to build things. Uh, you know, long times doing research to figure out how to do the specific thing that you want to do is where you're going to really kind of grow into your own, but you need to have those initial building blocks in order to do so. So um, my name is Alex Merced from alexmercedcoder.dev. That's my website, alexmercedcoder.dev. Make sure to follow me on Twitter, at alexmercedcoder. Have a great day and enjoy. I'll see you in the next one.